So great. Okay. Yep. You're ready and I'm ready. So wow, what a day. It's gonna be oh wow. Dr. Linda Lees. Is that, is that how I can I will address you? Yes. Dr. Linda? Okay. Wow. It's been quite a morning. Tell me, do you love mornings? I don't think so. No. No. You, how you? How do you go? I'm not a morning person okay. at all. Okay. Then how are you going to overcome the mornings every day? <laughs> well, um, under special occasions like this, I'm oh. I manage to do it, but I'm oh. definitely a night owl. Oh, night owl, really? Yeah. So you like to to hang My out? My background's in the theater. You know. Oh, okay. But, but, but do you like to go to concerts and? Well, yeah. If you're in theater, you have to be. You have oh, to oh, you love theater, for example. Okay. Well, I was a theater director. Oh, okay. Huh. I didn't know that. No, I didn't know. Oh, now I know. Oh, this well, is what interviews for. You find out all sorts of things you didn't know before. Oh, okay. <laughs> My PhD's in theater, actually. Oh. Charlie, please send me the information. Oh, gosh. Oh, no. I, I hate this. I really do. Uh, Hi, I welcome to the National Greatest Stories Online News. Say hi, I'm Robin Steinberg. Welcome to my show again. And today we have a very serious uh, talk with Dr. Linda Lees, and she happens to be the director and founder of uh, Creative Cities International. Uh, and it's a organization that brings together a list of world-class talent from around the world uh, to solve uh, the role of cultural uh, uh, regeneration of cities. And of course, um, Dr. Lee has led uh, CCI in partnering with architects, developers, and urban experts on a series of international conferences and forums on the creativity of cities and the link of economic sustainability. And so um, she will be sharing with us some issues on the on Vitality Index as well as the, uh, the cultural uh, context of what is, what is to come. Uh, Dr. Do, 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 Linda, welcome to my show again. And, Thank you. You know, um, I'm amazed that we've just found out uh, that you have a PhD in theater, you know, and and uh, and not, and you have a balance of the best of both worlds as as a, as a researcher as well. Um, how do you how did you how did you I mean, how do you do it? Well, I think theater, to me, theater is sort of a metaphor for life. You can, it gives you a lot of skills, gives you the opportunity to use your creativity and your vision. At the same time, it's very practical because you have to be able to implement that vision. You have to actually put it in three dimensions. You have a stage, you have people on a stage, they have to wear something, you have to have a set. So. I think that I, it's, it's, it's great to have good ideas, it's important, uh, but at the same time, we are also very interested in what it takes to implement that, and that's critical for cities, because ideas, I won't say are a dime a dozen, but it's easy to have them, it's much more difficult to figure out how to make them happen. Amazing. You know, uh, you know speaking about ideas, and you know, what, what's, what inspired you to, do, to be part of uh, the Creative uh, Cities International. I mean, what, what brought you to that level? I was first working with the British Council and uh, it happened that I was overseeing a cultural festival in 2001 and as a result of touring the UK I was introduced to the idea of the creative city that seemed to be a good um, a theme for the cultural part of that program, bringing people together to talk about what would be sustainable ideas to regenerate cities. Um, so we were doing that. As it turned out, the festival was one month after 9-11. Uh, so this began to change the whole frame uh, of how we looked at cities. At the same time, when we started to look at how badly uh, the planning was going on around Ground Zero, we felt there had to be another way to bring together public interest and public participation in something that obviously was critical to the future of New York City and, and about which all citizens of New York City felt very strongly. Uh, with a better urban planning process. And it's clear that there are better ways of planning than happened at Ground Zero, uh, where we still, we have some progress, but after 10 years, not nearly as much as we ought to have. 
And there are examples of that. So we thought, how do we bring together best practice from cities around the world? How can we apply it not only to New York City, but to others? So that there is a better uh, uh, kind of database for uh, cities, not just first tier cities, but second and third tier cities to learn from cities that have solved similar problems. Well, and now speaking about cities and cultures, the, uh, what is uh, a vitality index? People are trying to understand that, you know, and how does that work and apply for policymakers around the world? Well, the vitality index was the structure that we hit upon. When you talk about how do you deal with issues of um, cross-disciplinary work, where you have transportation experts, housing experts, architects, and they're all speaking their own language. So that's a first problem to solve. How do you take that, help them communicate better, and then communicate with the public? Um, the other aspect is how do you take case studies from different parts of the world and what is the means by which you organize that, that information. So we hit upon this idea of a vitality index to say, how can we use this and understand the very essential thing that every city wants? And that is to be an exciting and energetic place. Wow. And that is how, what we call it, it said, in a sense, you know, sort of joking around in a way, but if you could bottle this, what would it be? What is that essence of vitality in a city and you know it when it's there and you know it when it's not there. Wow, amazing. And that's how Michael Bloomberg was inspired by, by this. <laughs> you know, uh, you know uh, and Bloomberg, you know, my mayor, please, you know, please do watch my show. I know that you hate me, but uh, no, <laughs> just kidding you. Uh, that we have a lot of respect for Michael Bloomberg for creating New York City as one of the best cities in the world and he has won the Lee Kuan Yew Prize this year, 2012, uh, in Singapore. And also, um, about the vitality index, of course, you know, it's not just having having a index, but it is vital as well to create vibrant uh, in, uh, forces around the world. Uh, Linda, you know, how could policymakers be able to subscribe uh, you know, to your cause? Well, what we're interested in doing is, is bringing more cities into the index. Right now, the first iteration we, we published last year is 35 cities in the U.S. a ranking, but we would like to expand this globally. We've been in conversation with the UN Alliance of Civilizations, who have taken a great interest in this, but we would be interested particularly in Latin America and Asia, uh, looking at other cities, but because, because this also has to be culturally specific, it's not something that we can go in and do without a partner on the ground, uh, in country, as it were. So we are looking to expand it in that way. So obviously, the more information, the better it is for, for every city, and particularly the second and third tier cities, which are going to experience the greatest growth over the next 20 to 50 years. So it's quite important that they begin to learn the best practice, the lessons, the good lessons learned from other cities sooner rather than later. Now, what about the cultures uh, that is now uh, you know, evolving? Uh, especially in the cities. Uh, could you elaborate that? Culture in terms of why it's important for cities? Yes, that's right. Um, well, this is in fact a cultural approach because we value the qualitative factors in a city as much as we do the quantitative. And no other index does that. And what's more, we're not prescribing something that you have to have. We're finding out what people actually care about in their cities what they like, what they don't like, what they actually believe would be better. This is, we think, key because any projects that go forward without public participation are ultimately going to fail. So culture allows for everything. It takes in economics, it takes in infrastructure issues, but most importantly, it takes in the people who are most affected by these policies. Now, what kind of challenges uh, do policymakers and even developers face to, uh, today and for tomorrow? Uh, and what kind of arguments do you foresee? Well, I think that policymakers actually face the problem of one, maybe, no offense, their own obstinacy at not looking at the a cultural, at how important cultural issues are, because they think that it's too soft, to decorative, not fundamental to their projects and to urban growth. Um, 
I obviously don't agree with that because we're actually putting a number on qualitative issues so that they can see how important it is. So their own attitude is a very critical issue. That's one thing. The second thing is growth itself. How are they going to deal with you know, migrations of populations into second and third tier cities and provide transportation, provide, you know, housing, education, all the things that are necessary. These are completely people-oriented issues, so they really do need to sort of shift how they are looking at, at city growth and make it more a bottom-up point of view than a top-down which I, I said I think is doomed to failure. And what kind of what kind of uh, of advice would you able to give uh, to give us some three points of advice for policymakers uh, looking forward uh, into their planning and, and, and trying to restructuring uh, their, their formats and how they can create a vitality. Uh, experience for your cities? Well, I think the first thing, again, is going back to the bottom up. I think that there is a tr it, it, there's much more energy and creativity in neighborhoods and in the, in the population of each city than, than policy makers and politicians usually give credit for. But what, and they don't give credit for it because they don't actually know it's there because they ha haven't asked people. So what we're trying to set up is a way to ask, ask people what it is that they care about, but also what they're already doing because there are tremendous in initiatives in every city, large or small, that show what pe where people are willing to put their time and energy that increases their participation. And I don't <coughs> think it, that any city really doesn't want people to participate because that makes the job of maintaining the city much easier. So I think that's the critical first thing. I think you know what we're also trying to support is the idea of learning from other cities. Uh, every city, I think, almost is like a um, you know a patient on a on a psychiatrist's couch. You know, they think that oh no, our problems are the worst. We can't solve them. They're intractable. When in fact, there probably are cities somewhere else in the globe that have faced those same problems and found some solutions. So we're looking for adaptable solutions, uh, flexibility. So I would say those are the things that begin to, that are actually things that can be implemented, but do take a different mindset. Now, what will be your most memorable experience uh, for your institute uh, thus far uh, you know, in, with uh, Creative Cities International? Uh, have, you, have you guys actually accomplished uh, anything uh, for the last 12 months? Oh, well, actually publishing the, <laughs> publishing the index itself was a major undertaking because we did 35 cities, we did an online survey, we had to gather quantitative data, we had to gather qualitative data, we had to figure out how to assess it. Since this was the first time cultural data like this has ever been gathered in the United States, wow. that, that was an undertaking. And then tr understanding how we were going to think about it, um, how we were going to crunch numbers on it. Each one of those pieces was original research. There was no formula to follow for this. So this wow. is a completely so, new thing. And so how, what was the, uh, the, uh, the, the kind of team that you, that you had to get such uh, extensive research? Well, we had to have people who had background in gathering quantitative data. So those are people with MBAs and a lot of a lot of experience in things called site selection, uh, which is where you know corporations are looking to to uh, to move somewhere, and they need to know what in fact what would be the assets of a particular community for the thing that, that they're trying to do there. We use some of those ideas, uh, but we did have very sophisticated people working on the quantitative data, and then of course we had to decide ourselves through the Creative Cities prism how we were going to weigh those things because we were weight the, weighting them differently. On the qualitative side, we had to come up with a research methodology. These are not my areas, that's why I have experts to do that, of how we would go about an online survey and then how we would uh, begin to understand that data and put it into a form that was, again, since one of our main 
uh, our, our main principles is to communicate to the public, to talk about it in language that was readily available and in fact um, interesting for the public at large. So we were trying to create a new vocabulary, hence the term good messiness. <laughs> and so, and so, speak about uh, you know new uh, new vocabulary uh, for your audience and as well as for your customers. What sort of criteria uh, are you looking for in order for your organization able to work alongside with institutions, policymakers in a specific country? Do you do you have any guidelines that that you that you set? Well, we have again, this, you know, not, not to keep harping on this, but the, you know, the basic principle has to be that people are the center of the city. The city is about people. It's not, it is not just a paradigm for experts to make decisions that are based on, you know, that are good on paper, but don't necessarily consider the implications for, for, for the end user, which is every citizen in the city. So that is a critical starting point. Um, we what we found in this survey, which as I said sounds simplistic but can't be overemphasized, is people like to be together. Mm -hmm. uh, connectivity matters. So being given public access, public space, uh, sometimes there are wonderful public spaces in cities that are underutilized, that aren't, 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 put, aren't, aren't, aren't uh, kept, uh, kept in good shape so people can use them, those are important. So, but, but what we would use for a city in the U.S. might not be the same thing that we would look at for a city in Europe or in the Middle East or in Asia. So all the things, one of the, one of the things we think is so, so powerful about the Vitality Index is that it can be adapted and be flexible to the values of a community, of val the values of that city. So we're not imposing only our point of view. Yes, we have a philosophy but we are we are open to how that is used within a cultural context. Now, speaking about cultural context, uh, thank you for sharing with us. You know, here at the National Creative Choice, uh, is there any way that uh, uh, our viewers could uh, check up uh, on your website? Do you have a website address? We do. Uh, and what what is that? Uh, it's very simple: www.creativecities, plural, dot org. Creative cities, one word, dot org. And there you go. Uh, you have the website address, and do look up for uh, Dr. Uh, Lee's uh, research and updates. And once again, thank you for joining me here at the National Career Choice. Say hi, I'm Robin Steinberg. Have a great week ahead. Thank you, Robin. You're most welcome. <laughs> it is. I hope it's fruitful. Uh, did I draw anything out from you? No, that was good. Uh, I okay. enjoyed that.